Well, I will introduce myself from here and then say, hi, I'm Mark Rutland. I'm at ARM uh, talking about this control flow integrity stuff. Uh, Joe, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. So I'm John Modeda. Uh, I work for Intel. Spent some time in academia doing uh, control flow integrity kind of research. And uh, that's it. Maybe Peter? Peter? I'm uh, Peter Zostra. Most of you know me. I also happen to do this. And Sammy? Hey, I'm Sammy. I'm uh, in the Android platform security team at Google. Cool. I'll leave it to you, Joe, for now. OK, uh, thank you. I just close the door in a sec. I'll be right back, because dogs. What's up? Bye. Can the dog present, Joe? Is that an option? That would be fun. OK, I'm sorry. I'm in. Dogs got crazy. So uh, yeah, I mean, I'm here with Peter, Mark, and Sammy. We're going to talk a little bit about how we're planning to do the control integrity kind of upstreaming uh, in the kernel. I mean, it's mostly like actually Peter, Sammy, and Mark doing the work. I'm just here like annoying them. So uh, I guess I have to start with some disclaimers from my employer, because I have to put this on the slides. So be aware about all of these. And uh, now let's talk about why control flow integrity. So as most of you know, uh, if you do have like a code written C, you are going to end up with a lot of like memory safety bugs. So things that allow like an attacker or like malicious user to corrupt your memory. Mm. And by exploiting this sort of like bugs, an attacker might be able to overwrite a function pointer or maybe like a return address on your stack. And uh, using that, you might be able to do what we call the control flow hijacking, which is basically like taking control over the control flow of your application and doing like a bunch of stuff that you might not want he or she to do. Uh, because of this kind of problem, it's like sort of like a very old problem. Uh, there are like a bunch of mitigations in place. So first, for example, you have like a write XOR execute uh, kind of mitigation, which says that when you have like a writable page, this page should not be executable. And by doing that, you basically like are preventing an attacker from injecting code into your uh, application memory. You also have like stuff like ASLR, which randomizes the data structures and the code uh, within the, the application memory and makes it like harder for an attacker to figure out where a pointer is. So he may not like be able to overwrite it or even like uh, a structure in the code uh, that he might be willing to reuse for his attack and stuff like this. And well, when this came in place, attackers came out with different methods for attacking. So they sort of like using code reuse. So you might have heard of like a return to libc attacks or uh, memory disclosure attacks that are like uh, uh, bugs that allow an attacker to figure out the memory layout uh, in your application. So he basically like might be able to bypass his ASLR with these, so figure out where like is the stuff that he needs to override or to point to. And uh, in the kernel context, you also have like the return to user attacks, which basically the attacker would uh, manipulate memory in user space, and then just like uh, reference this memory from the kernel space. And because of things like this, uh, I mean, mitigation basically implemented this concept of strong Azure space isolation. You might have heard of SMAP or SMAP, uh, which is uh, uh, CPUs extensions that basically prevent you from the referencing user space memory from, from the kernel side. And uh, by doing that, you basically like prevent an attacker from uh, just manipulating your memory in user space and then um, using it in, in, in his or her attack. Uh, because of stuff like this, uh, people came up with these uh, ROP, JOP, or COP kind of attacks. ROP stands for uh, return-oriented programming. JOP is like jump-oriented programming. COP is call-oriented programming. It's basically like uh, indirect branches uh, being exploited to allow uh, uh, control flow hijacking. I like to call this whatever op or WAP because, I mean, in the end, it's just like an indirect branch that is being uh, used to, to launch the attack. And uh, what the WAP basically consistent is uh, reusing uh, kernel code or, or the application code already, which is there using this uh, concept called gadgets. And a gadget is basically like a small instruction sequence, which uh, ends with the indirect branch being used to launch the attack. And uh, because the attacker might be able to uh, manipulate uh, the memory, which is used to define the target of this indirect branch, 
uh, the attacker may just like, you know, start like chaining these small sequences. And when they end with the branch instruction, they're going to jump into the next gadget and then jump to the next gadget and so on. And by doing this sort of stuff, uh, the attacker might be able to achieve this meaningful or malicious computation. So imagine, for example, that uh, he might be able to disable uh, SMAP, for example, and then from there, once SMAP is disabled, he might be able to just uh, 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 manipulate user space memory and from there, like launch a new attack and stuff like this. So it's it's really like kind of complicated sort of attack to mitigate. Uh, and because of these sort of attacks, which are like kind of like randomly, uh, not randomly, but arbitrarily uh, chaining these gadgets into your application memory, uh, then came this, I mean, people came with this idea of like control flow integrity, which is basically, uh, confining the indirect branches, uh, of your application, uh, to previously computed locations. So you build like a control flow graph of your application and you say, yeah, I mean, every indirect branch is only supposed to go to this set of specific, uh, targets. And, uh, by doing that, you were like not prevent you were like not enabling him from or her from uh, directly calling random pieces of code and like chaining them at will in a way to uh, achieve the malicious computation. Uh, when it comes to CFI, we have like basically two big groups. We have a, what we call coarse grain CFI, uh, where you have like valid and invalid targets mostly, so you don't have like subgroups for them. So if you have an indirect branch, this is specific indirect branch is, is allowed to go to any valid target. So you only have like a valid and invalid targets. It's, you don't have like a classification for them. And, uh, it was shown by uh, researchers, academia mostly that this, uh, you sort of like a, a mitigation is insufficient because for example, imagine that you, you eventually might need to call a function directly. Uh, and then if you just call this function indirectly in a different context, you might be able to. I mean, still attack the system. It would be the case, for example, with a disabled security feature kind of function. So if it eventually needs to be indirectly called, then it would be callable from any indirect branch in the application. And well, this just still like poses a problem. Then uh, people came with a more strict sort of policy, which is the, the fine grained CFI. And the idea is basically you cluster the, the targets and groups. So now an indirect branch has a specific subgroup of targets that it is allowed to go to. So we are not like able to point to all the indirect branch targets from a single, for, from a one specific uh, indirect branch target. And this has shown to be like much more uh, uh, reliable in terms of uh, security than doing coarse grain kind of thing. Uh, slides not moving. Okay. So uh, here we're mostly like talking about for, for an edge, fine grain CFI. Uh, I mean, we are, I mean, the current implementation that we are discussing, it's not like uh, really focusing on, on the return instructions right now. So we're like uh, focused on doing like a function pointer protection. So indirect call protection. And, uh, as some of you may know, uh, defining the possible targets for a specific, uh, indirect call is kind of hard. So it's, it's, a, a, an undecidable problem from the computation perspective. So you can't like really just go in your, in your, uh, source code and figure out what are like the precise set of functions that should be callable from a specific function pointer. You cannot like really do that by just doing analysis. So we need to come up with some heuristics for doing that. And, uh, there's this, this idea of like doing pointer and function prototype matching. It actually like comes from a paper from 2005, uh, written by Abadi, which is the very seminal paper on CFI. And, uh, the idea here is that. You, if you ever declare the pointer in C, you know that you need to put a prototype on it. And, uh, if you ever declare the function, you need, you definitely know that you also like need to have a prototype for it. So if you have like prototypes for both of these, so before you actually execute, uh, an indirect call, just make sure that the pointer being used in this indirect call has the very same prototype as the function, which is being called. And by the way, we're basically like clustering based on the prototype of functions. Uh, this approach is like rather old. It's been used, uh, on other existing solutions. So we have jar security wrap, Clink CFI does the same thing. Microsoft X FG does the same thing too. So, uh, it's, it has shown to be like uh, quite, uh, useful and safe to some extent. Uh, currently in the Linux kernel, this is what we have and what we are discussing for next steps. 
So first you have uh, internal enrich tracking. This is a coarse grain scheme and it's hardware based. So it's like a CPU extension. You have uh, ARM BTI, which is also coarse grain and also like based on, on the hardware extension uh, from ARM. And you also have like a Clank CFI on ARM. This is already supported. This is already there. And it's a uh, fine grain software based CFI. So basically you just use Clank to emit specific uh, code constructs to, to enforce the CFI. And the idea is to replace these with KCFI uh, as soon as possible, I guess. Uh, as said, I mean, we're currently like working on a few schemes. First one is KCFI, which is mostly being written by uh, Semi by now, by now. And uh, it's fine grain, it's full software based. So it's been implemented on, on Clang. And uh, I think that it already landed on Clang. And I think that it's it's almost there for, for the kernel support. And uh, we also have this idea of like doing fine IBT, which is uh, basically reshaping the way that IBT is used. So it's like a, let's say IBT hybrid approach. So it uses the, the hardware extension, but extends it a little bit with some compiler instrumentation to make the actual IBT uh, fine grain. So it's uh, sort of like hybrid approach to, to achieve the same kind of uh, security that uh, KCFI provides with a few advantages. Now I'm gonna head over to Sammy to talk about his work on KCFI. All right. So as mentioned, ARM64 at the moment supports uh, Clang CFI, which uh, Google is uh, currently shipping in Android kernels. However, the CFI scheme was uh, primarily designed for C++ applications in user space, which makes it not quite ideal for kernel use. Um, basically, it uses jump tables for validating indirect call targets, which means it has to change all function pointers to point to a jump table. And this is a problem in cases where we need the actual function address instead. And uh, additionally, each kernel module has its own jump table, which means that this breaks uh, cross-module function address equality, which causes all kinds of fun problems. Um, Clang also requires uh, link time optimization to be used with CFI, so the compiler can determine all the call targets. And uh, that significantly increases compilation times and can also increase binary sizes, uh, which uh, makes it undesirable in some cases. So that brings us to KCFI, which is a new fine-grained CFI scheme that we contributed to Clang recently. And it should be in the upcoming Clang 16 release. And it avoids all the aforementioned issues with the Clang CFI and uh, therefore making it more kernel friendly. Um, KCFI is extremely simple. It uh, consists of the compiler emitting a type hash before each function entry and then before each indirect call, a check that reads the type hash and ensures we're jumping to a function with the expected type. Uh, it should be noted that reading the type hash obviously makes this uh, scheme incompatible with execute only memory, should the kernel support that one day. Uh, if there's a type mismatch, KCFI always traps and uh, leaves it to the kernel to handle the error. Right, can I change to the next one? So because of, uh, of the design, KCFI requires some minor changes to some assembly functions, specifically any function that's indirectly called from C code must be manually annotated with the correct type hash or, or indirect call checks will fail. What makes this uh, slightly more complicated is that the type information is only available in C, but the annotation must happen in assembly. So to make this easier, we change the compiler to emit a KCFI type ID symbol uh, for every address taken function declaration in uh, C translation units. That means that when you, when you link the C translation unit with the assemb annotated assembly code, it can uh, conveniently resolve the expected type there. We're introducing a macro that uh, makes adding this type information easier. Basically, it consists of uh, replacing the simfunc start macro with sim typed func star in the function definition. The only catch is that uh, you have to ensure that there's always at least one C translation unit that takes the address of the function. Just to add to that, because of um, other reasons for linking with modules, we normally have to do that anyway. So I think that should be okay. 
Yeah, it shouldn't be a problem, right? All right, and let's uh, quickly look at the actual instrumentation that we generate with uh, KCFI. You can see here uh, the target function bar has a preamble that contains the type hash. On ARM64, we simply have the 32-bit hash value, while on x86, uh, we emit a function symbol and uh, embed the type hash into an instruction. Uh, this is primarily to avoid confusing object tool and other parsers with random bytes, but also to enable fine IBT patching, which we will cover later. On the caller side, uh, the compiler emits the exact same check sequence for each indirect call, with uh, only the registers possibly changing. Uh, we can clobber caller saved registers here because the check is immediately before the call and any registers that were used were already saved. Uh, on x86, we negate the expected hash value and load it into the R10 register, and then at the hash, we read from the target. And if the result is, is not zero, we trap. Since uh, x86 has variable length instructions, it's important that we don't accidentally end up embedding the full hash into any of the instructions, as uh, that would create a valid indirect call target that an attacker could potentially exploit. And that's how we ended up with this specific sequence after some, some back and forth. Uh, so if the check fails, we're going to hit the trap. And uh, since the kernel doesn't otherwise know why we hit the specific trap, the compiler generates a KCFI traps section, which contains the locations of all the traps in uh, CFI checks. Um, the trap handler can then use the locations to see if this, if this was a CFI failure or something else. On the ARM64 side, uh, the instructions are all 32 bits long, so we don't have to worry about accidentally embedding the hash in them. The check here uses uh, two temporary registers, reads the target hash into one of them and loads the expected hash into the other one, and then traps if they don't match. And uh, unlike on x86, the trap instruction includes an immediate value which tells the kernel that this was a CFI failure. And it also encodes the registers we used in the check, so the error handler can conveniently report the actual values without having to decode the instructions themselves. And this also means that we don't need a KCFI traps section for ARM64. Um, by default, uh, KCFI failures result in a kernel panic, but the kernel can also be configured to use permissive mode, where it uh, continues execution after a type mismatch, only bring, printing out a warning. Um, version 5 of the KCFI series was posted to LKM last week, so please take a look if you are interested. And that was all I have. Do we have uh, Mark next to talk about BTI? Hi, yep. So as mentioned earlier, uh, ARM has one of these coarse-grained uh, forward edge control flow integrity features called branch target identification, or BTI for short. It's mandatory in ARM v8.5, so not in any hardware you have in your hand at the moment, but some point soon. Uh, it's out 64 only, so it only exists for 64-bit code. There is no equivalent in 32-bit. Um, if you want to look this up in the ARM architecture reference manual, look for this feet underscore uh, string. That's uh, what our architects want to call this. Um, the extension adds new instructions uh, called uh, intuitively BTI. Um, these are encoded uh, in a reserved space of uh, opcodes which behave as NOPs on existing hardware, so you can build binaries using this and they'll just work on existing hardware. Um, what these do is that they enforce indirect calls to these addresses land on these specific instructions. So a BR instruction, a branch register, which is like a jump on x86, must land on a BTI J or JC. The J and JC there stand for jump and call. Um, so it's just saying, you know that this thing is jumped to. Uh, BLR, branch and link register, which is our call instruction, can only land on a BTI C or JC. They can't land on a BTI J. So you place these uh, throughout your binary in the correct places, and only the correct instructions can land on these. Uh, in addition to this, there's a new attribute in our page tables called the guarded page bit, or GP. Um, 
to enable these checks, that bit needs to be set. So if for any reason you have a mixture of code where you can't apply this check, um, you can just disable the feature on a per page basis. Uh, can I move to the next slide? Uh, can someone move to the next slide? I don't have control. If you hit the plus in the bottom left and then say take, present, take presenter. It's fine. <laughs> yep. yep. Um, so how this works in practice is uh, you get a new compiler or a contemporary compiler uh, and you pass it some flags, which I forgot to put on the slide, but what it will cause the compiler to do is to place a BTIC or JC in the uh, function prolog at its entry point, uh, depending on whether it might be called directly for other reasons. Um, the existing auto ASP instruction, which is part of pointer authentication, is compatible uh, with BTIC, so we don't need to add two instructions there if you're already using that. Um, and in addition to that, the kernel obviously has to go and set the GP bit on its own code page tables. Um, when you have that, enforcement is assured. Um, so it works with uh, Clang version 12.0 plus. We had some unfortunate issues prior to that um, with linker stuff that doesn't matter. Um, and it was, is, sorry, it is present in GCC as well, but as of a few weeks ago, we've identified an issue where we've had to temporarily disable it. Um, due to um, GCC forgetting to place a BTI uh, in certain um, functions that are callable from a separate section, which could be placed too far away, go through a PLT, and the PLT uses a BR rather than a BLR, so it can't land on a BTIC. Uh, that's going to get fixed soon, but the fix isn't present just yet. Uh, and so with that, I think I'm done. I think it's Peter next. Let me go try and advance this thing. Take presenter, and I click. You can try the plus in the bottom left and then see. Oh, presenter. sorry. No, there was one more slide. I've forgotten. Sorry. Um, so this is what it looks like. Um, in your caller, Boo, um, we just have the exact call sequence you have today, BLR, branch and link register, where the address is in the register, x0. If a function might be called indirectly, so the compiler is aware that the address is taken or it's like exported or whatever, then it places one of these three instructions early in the prologue and then the rest of the sequence is exactly as it is today. And for a function that's only called directly, so via branch immediate or branch and link immediate instruction, it doesn't need to do anything special. It's just exactly as it is today. You don't need to put a BTI because those are not checked because we know at build time, the compiler didn't call the wrong function. Sorry, and now you can go, Peter. Hooray, that's me. Um, yeah, so Intel has a similar thing. We call it indirect branch tracking. You'll see it's the same three letters, but permuted differently. Um, it's part of CET, Control Flow Enforcement Technology. It's one half, the other half is shadow stack, as Case alluded to earlier today. Um, we too have new instructions, also taken from an instruction space that was previously not. Um, we have two, and branch 32 and branch 64 for respective code types. Um, the hardware raises a exception if you do an indirect jump or call and do not land on the end branch thingy. Um, unlike ARM, and this is how I ended up here, on x86, it's also specified that the indirect branch execution uh, stalls speculation until an end branch is enc encountered. Um, unlike ARM, uh, where they fill with page tables, we have a no track prefix. Um, if you add that prefix, uh, IBT gets disabled for one thing. Um, luckily, you can enable or disable the no track. Uh, prefix independently of IBT. So for the Linux kernel, we disabled that. No track is um, invalid in kernel code. Um, object tool actually checks for this. If it finds an instruction with a no track prefix, it will yell. Um, a consequence of this is that uh, we had to disable jump tables for x86-64 because GCC could not enable indirect branch tracking and not emit no tracks for jump tables. 
Um, luckily, jump tables were already disabled due to uh, red polines. Red polines make indirect jumps very much more expensive, um, and therefore jump tables are generally not worth it. Um, I think AJ fixed GCC. We now have an, another option um, so that we can do IBT and jump tables and not have the no track and then it'll sprinkle and branch all throughout the function. Um, I'm not sure what the Clang state of that is. Um, so for now, we still do the no and uh, no jump tables, even if you do not use red planes. Um, it's something that needs to be sorted out. Right, so the compiler, a recent enough compiler can, can emit and branch instructions. Um, we had to fix up the EBPF JIT to also emit them. Um, and I started coding this before I had hardware. Um, so I used object tool to find me all the locations that should have end branch and didn't. Um, I mean, the compiler generally puts in enough, mostly too many end branch instructions, um, but all our inline assembly also needs end branch. Um, so I wrote an object tool thing to uh, look at all the code references, every code um, location that has uh, its address taken um, and has a few other conditions like is the first instruction of a symbol should have end branch. Um, we have annotations for the cases where it shouldn't be and all that. Um, but that works. Um, we run this object tool pass at the v, uh, VM Linux stage. So it's an LTO-like run. This means we can find superfluous end breaks. Um, unlike ARM64, where they have the PLTs, we generally have a big enough immediate space to not need PLTs for the kernel. Hooray. Um, therefore, we can actually remove end branches. Um, so that we, we do that. Um, I scribble it with a four byte no op the end branch instructions are four bytes um if we were to fix up all the immediate jumps and calls to land at the instruction after end branch we could scribble it with a four byte trap and that would mean that even on non-ibt enabled hardware an immediate jump to a function that shouldn't take it will trap but finally, IBT and KCFI will, will fix most of that. So that's not really that important. Um, I think Zhuo um, once did an LLD variant that does the same through LTO uh, for Clang. The ceiling, that is. This is what it looks like. You do an indirect call or jump, doesn't really matter. Um, you need to land on the end branch, otherwise you get a CP trap. Um, and then, like uh, Sami said earlier, we'll, we'll either warn or just burn your machine. Um, a consequence of this, if you look at the address taken and the non-address taken thing, is that the Fentry call will not be at offset zero. And this was um, a lot of fun because Ftrace and everybody else um, assume that on x86, the Fentry call was at uh, offset zero for every symbol. Um, so that took a bit of wiggling around to fix all that. Um, but yeah, we got that sorted. And wow, so you want to do this again? Uh, sure, yeah. Feel free to jump in if you have like any comments or something. Uh, well, we we'll talk a little bit about fine IBT, which is a way we find out to be able to make IBT actually fine grained. So if you if you pay attention to what Peter said, I mean, you have the end branch instruction. End branch instruction is basically a, a valid target for any indirect branch. And uh, what this means is that you end up with a coarse grained contra flow graph. And uh, we don't want that because well, coarse grained is not good enough for for preventing contra flow hijacking attacks. So we actually like use the compiler to extend. Uh, the way that IBT is emitted in the code 
and make it like fine grained. We call this fine IBT, but it's actually like just a silly name for a compiler instrumentation. Uh, so uh, like, like we said, I mean, IBT will do the, the color side checks. So if you have like an indirect call go into a non-end branch instruction, you're gonna like crash. And fine IBT will basically augment uh, the prolog. So it's actually like a, a, a callee sign, uh, side check uh, for doing the prototype kind of checking and, 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 and hash uh, 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 matching. And uh, you can basically like just go to the direct calls and uh, argument uh, the operand there. So you just add a little bit, a uh, few, few bytes there to just skip these checks uh, from when you were, uh, uh, when you were doing a direct call, right? So you, you don't like get the checks uh, for direct calls because this wouldn't make sense. Uh, this is not exactly how we implement, how we came up to implement this in the kernel. We'll get there, but this was like basically the original idea. Uh, I need to get control again. So uh, the way we were thinking, fine IBT uh, is basically like to hot patch it on top of uh, the KCFI implementation. So basically you get KCFI, you compile your kernel with uh, KCFI and that's the the instructions that the compiler are going to generate, like on your left side of this this uh, snippet here, uh, and then uh, when you're basically booting your machine, uh, the kernel will just look if IBT is available. If that's the case, it will just like basically hot patch uh, your kernel memory to do the fine IBT uh, instrumentation, and uh, that's that's basically it's gonna it's gonna go to the what's like on the on the right side here. So uh, on the color side, we're basically like re replacing that uh, move minus hash with like a sub uh, and a few bytes, in this case, 16 bytes. The idea here is to, if you're doing an indirect call, you are gonna like actually target uh, a few bytes before the function entry point. And then you just put like the hash you want to match into R10. And uh, then on the on the Kali side, you have the end branch like 16 bytes before the function entry point, which basically allows the call to go there. And then you just uh, sub the hash from R10. And if the result of this operation is zero, which basically means that uh, the hashes are matching, you just jump uh, to the function entry point. Otherwise, you are going to hit the UD2 instruction, which you like trigger sort of like a CP and uh, whatever. Uh, one interesting thing about this fine ABT uh, instrumentation is that it like it doesn't depend on memory reads like uh, KCFI will do, and this actually like has some interesting uh, effects to the CFI scheme in general. So uh, first of them, I mean, like Peter said, I mean IBT will confine the speculative execution to the coarse grained uh, CFG. So if you have an indirect branch it's mandatory that this indirect branch will land on an end branch instruction, even speculatively. So you're not like able to just go out like uh, trying to mistrain indirect branches to go somewhere uh, arbitrarily, you need to end in an end branch. But then uh, when it comes to, to fine ABT, if we take a look, uh, I'm gonna like uh, move a slide back here. If you take a look at the instrumentation, you have like a conditional branch over there. So the, the JZ, and this conditional branch will actually like have a speculation window, yet uh, the resolution of the target for this uh, conditional branch only depends on instructions that are not doing a memory read. And because of that, because you were just like putting an immediate into R10 and then just doing a sub uh, from R10 uh, from another immediate, uh, the target resolution for this uh, conditional branch is, is like quite small. And because, I mean, the, the the resolution is like, it happens kind of fast within the CPU. And because of that, the speculation window is kind of small. And what this means in practice is that it is like kind of uh, rather hard for an attacker to place a speculative execution gadget that might be executed uh, within this uh, uh, this speculative window. And, and also like, it's not like kind of matching the hash. So. It like to some extent actually also enforces the fine grained CFG to the speculative execution behavior. Uh, and this like, of course, makes it like uh, the IBT hardening a little bit uh, further uh, strong. Uh, some other like important characteristics here is that uh, it makes fine IBT compatible with stuff like uh, execute only memory. So if you have been following the 
mailing list for a while. I mean, I think that a few years ago, Rick Edgecomb uh, submitted some patches for doing execute only memory using uh, MPK CPU extension. It's a rather cool uh, mitigation, prevents like a, sort of like different classes of attacks. And uh, because we don't like need to read from executable memory uh, to do fine ABT, uh, we might be able to make these two things work together. And also, I mean, because we don't have like a, a memory reads, it's likely to show better performance than KCFI. We never made these measurements and just like a super bold statement. Uh, cache is super efficient uh, for KCFI. I know it because I made some measurements long time ago only on KCFI, but still I think that not having the, the memory reads kind of like should be better. Uh, Peter, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, I wanted to, to mention Spectre BHB. So that sure. fine IBT with the speculation hardening is a is a valid defense against uh, Spectre BHB. Whereas currently, I think the recommendation is to run with Redpoline, even if you have enhanced IBRS available. Um, so in that respect, it would be a performance improvement as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, thank you for being more specific about it. I really don't know much about speculative uh, execution attack, so good to get very insight on that. Uh, another thing that I constantly think about when it comes to comparing fine IBT with KCFI, and this is like uh, really something up to discussion because I don't have like a closed idea about this, but I have like this understanding that fine IBT should be less disastrous when you need to relax things. So imagine you have like a function pointer in your source code and this function pointer is like a void star type. So you're going to call functions that don't have like a matching prototype. And because of that, you basically need to not do the, the CFI policy enforcement. And uh, with, with KCFI, what we would need to do is to basically not do the instrumentation of the indirect call. Uh, on fine IBT, it would be like a little bit different. So you would still have the, the, the IBT enforcement, right? So you still like have the coarse grain CFG uh, below everything. And then on top of that, I mean, all you need to do is to relax the function itself and not the function pointer. And what this means is that uh, you, because you know the function that you're relaxing. So let's say, uh, because you know that this function is like harmless, so it's not like a disable secret feature kind of function, you know that it is like safe to relax it. Otherwise, I mean, if you need to relax the indirect call, so if you need to relax the function pointer, uh, you can basically like reach any any point in the in the memory space from there. So you have like a relaxed uh, indirect call. You are now able to call, let's say, disable as map. Uh, function from there, and this is like uh, very disastrous because you are enabling uh, important secret feature to be disabled and so on. So just because you have like this sort of like uh, more fine grain control over what you are relaxing uh, with fine ABT, I think it makes like a little bit better from the perspective of uh, security. Uh, like I said, yeah. I mean, like up to discussion. Yeah, go ahead. So I, I think the most prominent no CFI in their echo we have is the jump into BPF, if I'm not okay. mistaken. So that thing is no CFI, right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, yeah, so yeah, that's, I, I think that a uh, long time ago, uh, we went down kind of fixing the void star uh, function pointers in, in, the, in the kernel code. I remember that, uh, I think I had like a batch with keys like a long time ago for the cryptographic uh, functions in x86 because you would have like a bunch of callbacks there. But I think that these are like mostly fixed now. Uh, I'm not sure how, how's the state in, in current code, but thank you for, for the update on, on BPF. Uh, so yeah, I mean, no CFI functions are like uh, rather uh, problematic, I guess. And you wouldn't like need to have this relaxed for, uh, for, uh, for fine IBT. So yeah. I think that these are like all the slides uh, I prepared. Uh, maybe we should jump into discussions if people have questions, suggestions, or anything. So I have a question. Um, earlier today, Case mentioned that this work was uh, coming along for Clang and uh, said that it would be good if GCC were to also do this. Is anybody actually actively looking at this? on an implementation for GCC? 
for KCFI that is. To my knowledge, no one is uh, working on JCC. Okay. Um, yeah, then the only comment I have at this point for the KCFI patch set is that um, I think the preprocessor symbol is Clang CFI or CFI Clang or something like that. Should we change that to be KCFI or something and not mention Clang? Or do we want to do a mass rename once GCC grows this feature? I am personally flexible here, so happy to hear any thoughts people may have. Yeah, the room shows it. Ah, perfect. Can, can you guys hear us now? Yes. Okay, sorry, we've been muted uh, and, <laughs> and trying to talk a few times up until this point. Um, Things generally don't matter. Can we go back one slide just before the questions? Absolutely. Because I was going to say that on the existing Clang CFI scheme, one of the reasons why we've had to disable checks is because of like calling into assembly functions in weird address spaces and so on. Um, with KCFI, we can actually have those checked because we can put the uh, type hash before those functions in assembly. So actually, we should get better protection there and we shouldn't have much reason to have to disable checks at all. So I'm hoping for ARM64, we will not have to disable any checks. Sorry. I was gonna, <clears throat> I was gonna say the, I haven't looked too closely at the patch set, but uh, around Peter's point about renaming the symbol, um, I think something that we, that Sammy did for LTO was, was have the LTO symbol signify that we're doing LTO um, but then have the choice be uh, around the compiler and the, the symbol that was actually selected by the user uh, was, was Clang. Um, and that would only be set or only selectable if, if Clang was being used. That way you have the uh, separation of, of the feature versus the compiler that's being used. So something that might be, be helpful for us to look at is um, where are we setting you know, Clang CFI as, as the config symbol and seeing uh, if we can separate that uh, from the feature being enabled and, and stuff that's going to be more generic that GCC might be able to take advantage of um, and things that are more implementation uh, of Clang based that maybe want to be surrounded by a, a Clang CFI symbol. Yeah, that sounds entirely reasonable to me. Any other comments or questions for our speakers? I think people tentatively raise their hands, but quickly drop them. So. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Here we go. It's not a question, but mostly thank you all for doing this work. It, it took a lot of coordination and it's awesome. I'll point out that there are many others doing yeah. the work. Um, some of whom are here. Like... <laughs> right on. Thanks everyone for coming to the table. A lot of work goes into this. So hopefully we can provide safer uh, kernels for everyone. <coughs> okay, if that's all the talk, all the comments and questions we have, let's have a round of applause for our speakers.